This week on Movie Time Machine, after a space merchant vessel receives an unknown transmission as a distress call, one of the crew is attacked by a mysterious life form, and they soon realize that its life cycle has merely begun. This is Alien. <laughs> to Movie Time Machine, your retro movie review podcast where we take movies from the past and relive them in the present. This week's movie, Alien, released in the year 1979, directed by Ridley Scott, screenplay by Dan O'Brien. I'm your Time Machine host, Chad. Before we get into our movie of the week, I want to introduce you to my Time Machine co-host. First, he's always living one beer behind in the entertainment world, it's Casey Hold on, what's that one beer behind or one year behind? One year behind. I, I'm always one beer behind, too. What? Okay. Hey, no, no, leave sure. it. I like it better that way. I thought it was one beer behind. <laughs> I was like, like, whoa. <laughs> All right, he's always living one beer behind. It's Casey. Our Gulp. living encyclopedia of movie knowledge. It's James. Hey, how's it going? And finally... Again, will he ever finish The Mandalorian? Because he can't even finish the movies and films and TV shows that he recommends for me. It's Jamie. This is the way. You can't even say that yet. I don't even like you saying things like that. Don't even quote Mandalorian (laughs) until you finish it. I was like, you can only quote Cobra Kai if you want. And you know what? Cobra Kai never dies. Never dies. I just saw they made a PS4 game or have a PS4 game of Cobra Kai. What? No is way. it like Street Fighter? If I get like Johnny Lawrence as a Street Fighter, I'm all over that. I, here's the deal. I saw the cover. I just assume it's like Street Fighter. But if, but otherwise, the other part of my head was like, what if you have different levels where Johnny's telling the kids like, <laughs> no, you're losers. <laughs> like, get, pick up your legs or whatever. I have no idea. It's just it, so many possibilities. <laughs> so have you seen any of the gameplay for that? I'm just curious, like if it's like a... Casey, not, Casey's just... already searching it, so go nuts. What is it, Casey? Well, I'm not, but I will. Oh, <laughs> Cobra Kai. I, I I haven't watched what a Cobra new video Kai, game. So I don't I know about that into it. Uh, yeah, is, there's is there a, the, the saga continues. No, it's just PS4. It does. Uh, it looks like it is a fighting game. Oh uh, yeah, looks just like a straight up fighting game, not like an adventure fighter, but like a fighting game, like a Street Fighter type thing. Now I'm Ooh, Jamie, looks kind of cool though, Jamie. I'm under the impression with the finale that I'm gonna need to actually watch uh, Karate Kid three. Yeah, that's. I think that would help a lot. I've only seen the first Karate Kid of the original series, so I was oh, so you, I was kind of lost. But they give you enough where you kind of can figure it out without having seen the movie. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Like, yeah, the first two though, I watched like all the time, and then yeah, the three and. All I'm waiting for now is because it seems like there's a lot of Hillary Swank Netflix shows out lately that I that she's going to show up in the finale and kill all of them. Like, I don't know, from the next Karate Kid. <laughs> all I, right, so I'm going to let you know what I've been watching lately. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chad. <laughs> well, based on Jamie's recommendation, I've actually been watching WandaVision on Disney+, Plus, the Marvel uh, series, and... As y'all know, I'm not a big MCU fan, but I'm really digging this show, especially after episode five. The ending of it was just like mind blowing. So excited to see where this goes. So can't wait till you guys get caught up with that. And um, I just found, was it last week after talking with a friend, I was inspired to go look up the um, decline of Western Civ documentary series. And that's what I've been watching lately. So not a whole lot outside of that. Chad, speaking of documentaries, did it, I yeah. mentioned to you that I watched Octopus Teacher? I couldn't remember. No, what'd you think? I loved it. I thought it was. Thank you for the recommendation. Um, it was awesome. Like I, uh, I wish there was more. I guess or something else like with uh, in a similar situation. Um, but just the fact that that dude went diving to the same spot every day for I, I think it was almost a year. It year. looked like at yeah. that time, and God, and like so he just got used to even like seeing the difference in the environment, knowing what's going on. And I mean, just as somebody who doesn't like, I don't know when I go snorkeling or diving or whatever, when I'm on vacation, um, 
my assumption is I'm with somebody bigger than me and they're ahead of me. Um, uh, Cause I don't know what anything in this finding Nemo land is. So the fact that this guy's just swimming around going, Oh no, it's cool. That's just a shark over there. I'm like, Oh, yeah. what is happening? <laughs> like this. So for the first part, I was just so uncomfortable and like the something bad's going to happen in that sense. But no, clearly that guy knew it and knows what he's doing in that sense. Um, I don't know, but it is the, yes, the relationship between him and the octopus is just, that was, it was just so cool. I loved it. I have extreme flaccophobia, which is like the fear of deep water. So that sounds like it would give fear me absolute flasks? nightmare. No, th- T-H-A-L-A-S, it's thalassophobia. <laughs> um, but like the, the game Echo the Dolphin on Sega, that like gave me chills just swimming yeah. around in deep water. So this, I'm both intrigued and uh, terrified by the concept of my octopus teacher. I'm looking it up now. It looks really cool, but terrifying. Good news yeah, for you really on that cool. case is just that he doesn't wear gear uh, so he can swim closely around everything. He's just got he's just snorkeling. So snorkeling. it's like he can get to the top of the water pretty quick. Hopefully that will put your mind at ease a little bit. But no, I yeah, get what so you're saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in next. Because I can't. I can't. Uh, like me, I would never even go like scuba diving or oh, anything freak, like that. I can't. Freaky. You know? Yeah, but. I went snorkeling in the in in Turks and Caicos. That was fun, but there was a boat right next to me, and it wasn't that deep. But like deep water, that freaks me out. So yeah, I'm going to jump went, on that and piggyback. Yeah, hop in. yeah. So uh, first of all, recommendation since we're talking about deep water things, if you haven't seen One Breath Around the World, it's a free diver like music video. It's on YouTube. It's like one of the coolest 12 minutes, and it gives me chills because there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of deep water stuff, but it's one of the coolest like underwater things. Cause he's a, he's a, a free diver that can hold his breath for, you know, minutes on end. So they made this 12 minute little film of him diving. And there's just a scene partway through where he swims by these like sleeping whales. I don't know. I, I don't want to describe it too much. You just have to put on some headphones and watch it. It was uh it's amazing. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And I'm going to piggyback on top of Chad as well. I'm just going to jump right on your back. Um, I recently have for the first time watched uh, uh, Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. So jumping on the MCU bandwagon with you. Um, yeah, first time I'd seen them. I, uh, they were very long. I enjoyed them. They were, they were uh, enjoyable enough. Uh, I have critiques, clearly. Um, they're definitely uh, mindless comic book movies. So there's some things where... You know, I think, well, why did they even bother doing that? Because in, in my, for me, the the last forty five minutes of Infinity War were basically uh, a waste of time just to to show a giant battle scene because it was all like, don't we have to destroy the stone? Let's destroy the stone. And then Thanos goes, yeah, I can just rewind that. Sorry. So it's like, well, what's the point? Forty five <laughs> minutes of that for him just to un to unwind it. They just wanted a CGI fight fest. So, but whatever, it was cool enough. So those are the things I've been watching. Oh, no, I have one more thing. Uh, right. I've just found, I don't know if you guys ever watch, uh, the in the UK, they have a lot of comedy panel shows. I don't know if you ever watch YouTube clips of any of the panel shows. There's just a bunch of like, I don't know, it must just be what stand-up comics do in, in the UK. They're on all these different shows. But there's this uh, a show I've been finding clips on YouTube that are really funny called Taskmaster where it's like they put these, uh, I don't know, five different comedians or whatever, these five different celebrities or comedians in a house, and then they have to just do really silly tasks. And I don't know, it's just goofy, and it's really uh, it's really silly and kind of mindless, fun stuff. And the reason I found it is because I'm a big fan of Noel Fielding. Um, I don't know if you know who Noel Fielding is, no. if you've seen like the IT crowd or... Uh, he was the, one of the hosts of the Great British Baking Show right now. I don't know, UK comic, um, but he's oh, on a yeah. few of those I like too. Him. He's a funny guy. Yeah, super funny guy. He's been in some of the episodes too, and they're just they're just super goofy. So I would uh, just YouTube like Taskmaster clips and find some of them. And, and if you think it's funny, it's a it's a pretty funny show. Sweet. What have you been up to, Jamie? Oh, uh, it's my turn. Let's see. I was trying to think of something. So I'm really into i'm kind of in a show hole right now my fault i got the mandalorian i got wandavision i'm not doing my due diligence there but i've been watching <laughs> jeopardy this week and jesus christ jamie <laughs> <laughs> you what you don't like jeopardy no i'm just kidding Go ahead. is it uh ken jennings is still hosting or are they a new host now no it, it's still ken i had this weird <laughs> moment today where i went like johnny gilbert who's still 90 years old on the show still doing his thing 
and I'm in the kitchen, like, getting a snack, and he goes, like, and the host of Jeopardy, and my mind was, like, Alex Trebek, you know? And then it was Ken Jennings, and I was like, oh, shit. Like, I, you know, Trebek, unfortunately, lost his battle. It's been at least a month, but my mind was like, it's still Alex. You know what I mean? That was my weird Jeopardy moment of the day. Oh, Jamie, I thought you were going to say that you were watching, like, binging, like, old episodes of, of Jeopardy oh, on, I've... like, some strange... He's rewatching show. Survivor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't threaten me with a good time. S- Survivor Jeopardy. Oh, see, that's if you could get me on one show, it would be Survivor Jeopardy. <laughs> what if there's a crossover where they have to answer a question and then like go without food for two weeks? And, and I cross a balance beam. <laughs> <laughs> and floor is lava. Yeah. Oh my god, I cannot <laughs> wait for season two of Floor is Lava. <laughs> All right, oh. now on to the topic of the week. This week's film is Alien. Jamie, this was your pick. Yeah. Why? In the hell did you pick Alien? Why in the hell Alien? Great <laughs> question. So I've, uh, you know, you get your four Mount Rushmore films on Letterboxd, and this marks the third one we reviewed on the pod. We've done Big Lebowski, The Thing, Alien. So if we ever make it to Inglorious Bastards, we'll hit my top four on Letterboxd. That's not why I picked it. I picked it um, simply because it's just one of my favorite movies of all time. It's, um, you got sci fi, you got horror. It's survival horror. Um, it's uh, a blue collar working crew working for mm-hmm. a corrupt uh, company wh- who doesn't have their best interests at heart. So basically, if you took all my interests, oh, and a strong female lead, that's not an essential in every movie, but it's nice when we get a really good one. Um, and Sigourney Weaver is just phenomenal. So yeah, basically everything I love into one single movie. All right. So. Before we get too deep into this now, this is considered a horror film, sci-fi horror. So, Casey, now, is this the first time you've watched this film? I think it's probably the first time I've watched it all the way through. Mm -hmm. Um, I have seen bits and pieces of it, but I don't think I've actually sat and just watched the whole thing. Yeah. So, I know that you you always say, like, you love all things space, right? But mm-hmm, you're typically mm-hmm, not mm-hmm. a fan of the horror <laughs> genre. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, being that this is the first time you think you've you've actually sat down and watched this movie, what do you think? This is this is the type of horror that I can get behind. Um, there's very few jump scares, and when they use them, they're almost like misdirection. Like the jump scares were the cat or something else. You know, it was never really uh, the xenomorph popping out for the most mm-hmm. part. And when you the the scary parts it was scary because like you were faced with the evil in a really low light scenario you know you didn't see much of it but you know you know shit's about to go down so i like um you know if you have a horror movie like this where you are building uh just a crazy cool and dark and kind of terrifying environment um and and the characters are well written and and everything's kind of puts together well and you're not relying on you know cheap jump scares or you know big scary Mm -hmm. bloody demons and you know a lot of gore and things like that um no i I think this this was uh this is a great film i really enjoyed it i think my favorite part um about it though especially being a, a space junkie is that this felt like one of the most realistic depictions of space travel like obviously when we do get out into space we're not flying on these big giant jets like even the landing scene where they landed on on the planet and they're showing how coordinated and much of a giant effort it was just to land this giant ship um and then they have to go fix it much like it felt like i was watching u571 or something you know where they had to go fix the sub that's sinking mm-hmm. you know yeah. they're down in the engine rooms and, and whatnot so it was, uh, it was a really good cross of like realistic feeling space travel um with some really good kind of horror built into it so i thought it was great james what's your what's your connection with this film uh don't really have a connection with this film like i think it it, it was i think it's the second time i've seen it like much like case i'm pretty positive like i'd seen it in chunks and i feel like i'd seen it all in its entirety a while back um i just couldn't remember so this is the first time i've watched in a while um mainly going off of the alien story from prometheus um is my basis of knowledge because that one was more uh, I saw that more recently, I should say. Um, but watching this, it definitely put me down the rabbit hole where I, I watched this. Then I watched Prometheus. 
and then I watched Blade Runner, and so then I was on this Ridley <laughs> Scott tear. Nice. Um, and then, yeah, so I don't know. Uh, but um, which, I, but I think interestingly enough, if I got the years right, the year in that this that Alien took place was also the year that Blade Runner took place on Earth in that it was like what 2087 or something like that so if that makes any if that makes any sense and i'm sure there wasn't any correlation clearly but i just thought that was interesting so in my head i'm like thinking okay so if that's what earth looks like and they're doing all this like running in space like cargo ships i'm like i mean i feel like that could work uh with like the timelines and like what's going on because everybody's doing off-world things in uh blade runner anyways back to alien um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> conversational podcast right uh back to the alien i no, i really and en- i really enjoyed this one uh i thought whenever i try to put myself in the place of like so this was made in 79 that like that's i think the effects and everything else that were done in there are kind of crazy even the details of the set design of like they had them creating this ship and this kind of world um and even the effects of uh th- not even necessarily just the xenomorph um like what they were doing with the droids or or android i should say and then uh, the um the other i don't know what you would call the alien that um latches onto their faces suck face guys face hugger face huggers yeah so like but even just like those guys like yeah as far as special effects go um i think i was reading um i think i was reading that like when the alien first popped out of uh, the dude's stomach like for the first time i think they like uh, ridley scott didn't tell the cast what he was doing and so when he made it erupt from their stomach it was like actual like like pig guts or you know just something like real realistic and then it just made the whole set just reek and like that's why they got genuine reaction and like uh, uh one of the characters oh what was the guy it started with a d um, dallas dallas like got sick and like was like traumatized for like two days or something oh, <laughs> like yeah. it was just something like a crazy like that where i'm like i'm like but awesome. these are when i was just like thinking like this is like when i feel like directors of a certain time like young younger directors at the time that were kind of ahead of their time could get away with this stuff like i'm sure at the same time like in the 80s like so ridley scott and coppola and zumeckis and all of them and spielberg could get away with doing these shock value things like i think it's the same idea of nobody wanted to work with James Cameron after the abyss because of certain things he would do on set. And just was this like, like where like they were doing scenes underwater and like his actors were almost drowning. <laughs> like, but like, he's like, I need to get the shot. <laughs> and this all like this all natural, like reaction of for things. And I'm sure that after they were done with this, they hated his guts or I don't know. And maybe he was a, just a pleasure to be with. <laughs> uh, well, clearly, clearly uh, Sigourney does a few more alien films, but Ridley, I don't believe is a part of them. So. I don't know. It was very enjoyable. Yeah. So, Jamie, I want to ask you because I know that you're a big Carpenter fan, or like you, you like the thing. So, and then I know that we, you and I, we did um, Escape from New York. Um, and I was also looking up that the writer, so Dan O'Bannon, worked with John Carpenter on the film Dark Star. And that was the inspiration for O'Bannon to write the screenplay for alien to be a horror movie in space versus dark star i think was kind of like a like a kind of like a comedy um kind of making fun of like the sci-fi genre i could see that no sorry i'm failing you here because i've I've never seen dark star but yeah i haven't either it was a i think it was kind of a it was a really bad movie i was watching an interview with oban and he was saying that he because i think they met met each other maybe like in college or something like that and he's like we went from making like a really great um student film to a really big like bad film or something <laughs> like that um <clears throat> so yeah it was a kind of inspiration from there and there's there's things that he was doing in that time too where he like flew off the paris and that's where he met H.R. Geiger, and then, like, those connections obviously come back later for um, Alien as being, like, the designer of, like, the xenomorphs and, like, all, like, the, a lot of the sets and that you see throughout the Alien uh, series. Um, so it's kind of cool to see, like, all these, like, kind of random events, like, you know, coming together, you know, a few la- years later. Um, so, Chad, inspiring this in this film. 
Who's yeah. Geiger? I I know I know his name only from this movie, but he's a very interesting artist, right? What what's like your five minutes on Geiger? My five minutes? I'm, I'm yeah. not really up to on Geiger, but I would for me like the most famous works of his are obviously like you know Influence and Alien. Um, he did the um, so if you're familiar with the band Dead Kennedys, they released an album called Frank in Christ. The original album cover art for that was a hr giger i think it's the, the correct pronunciation did the work and it looked like it was like uh it was like a bunch of it looked like it looked like asses and looked like it they're all like it's like field of dicks field. or something like that yeah and like so there was like this huge like court drama censorship stuff so they want they wouldn't put it on the cover as the cover art so that's why they have like the freaking christ cover is the guys driving in like the little the little shriners the guy shriners driving like the little cars on the album cover but then they're going to put it in the album as like a poster and then they got sued again so it's like it was like this huge like um censorship case or whatever but then um yeah, I was thinking of 92 when Danzig released Danzig 3. His art style is very much like uh, w- like humans mixed with machines in a really yes. dark yep. kind of mm-hmm. horror. Mm-hmm. It's a really cool, really unique, um, really unique aesthetic that I think people kind of strive to match now, but can't really get the, I don't know, just the way he does it. It's, it's haunting. It's really cool art. If you go ever just look up Geiger art, Geiger art, whatever. Yeah, that reminds me too. Like the I was, this interview I was watching with Obama was saying, like the first time when he met Geeger, he like passed like some tin foil to Obama, and it was like opium. And he's like, "Why do you, why do you need this, or why do you use this?" And he's like, "Because I'm afraid of my visions." <laughs> so he's like, I'm with "My visions, what I see," and he's like, "It's because they scare me, or some shit like that." Dude. <laughs> So he has a like take. next level artistry. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, his art is like very it's very cool but also kind of very disturbing. But yeah, it's that kind of like human mech metal kind of crossover, which really like does a great job, I think, with I think the awesome aesthetics of this film in Alien. And I feel like that's one of the things that kind of helps keep this film. I think still relevant. It doesn't look that old. I think in a few parts of this movie, it does look a little like the mother room. I feel like, boy, that looks like a (laughs) seventies. That looks very seventies. But outside of that, and like maybe like the one like space shot kind of towards the end where like the alien gets kicked out. um, Yeah, that's that's corny. And it's kind of like yeah, bouncing around. But I mean, that's it. I mean, that's kind of really picking nits. I feel like there, but. yeah. Well, and that's the whole purpose. <laughs> like, I think I was just reading a quote uh, from Ridley Scott, something about how he doesn't actually like horror. Hold on, I've got it. I've never yeah. liked horror films before because in the end, it's always been a man in a rubber suit, which is exactly kind of the ending of this film. Unfortunately, it's the big alien bouncing out of the yeah. ship all funny. Yep. But then he says, well, there's one day, way to deal with that. The most important thing in a film of this type is not what you see, but the effect of what you think you saw. Mm. So that's why, like, that's again why I think this. I don't like horror movies mostly, but this one I think is really good, just because most of it you're just kind of scared of what you, you can't see. Like you don't know, you don't see the alien ever, and when you do see it, other than the very end, you're seeing like glimpses. You see maybe just its mouth or part of its head or its tail. You never like see the whole thing in the flesh. That's kind of why I actually think Cloverfield is a pretty fun movie because you don't really know what the monster looks like for the majority. Most, I think all of the film, you don't really know. Well, I guess there's some helicopter shots where you see it, but I thought that was a really good, like mega monster movie too, because most of it's just like, you don't actually see it. You're kind of like left up to your own imagination. Yeah, I would agree with that, Casey. The only thing that took me out of Cloverfield was the shaky cam just like got a little motion sick, but the film itself was really good and you guys saw that deleted scene i sent you to your point there's one in there for the listeners who don't know where they have the xenomorph crab walk across the floor um to oh shoot what's her name veronica car to lambert Mm -hmm. when uh, she and parker go down and it's yeah it just kind of highlights why 
you shouldn't do that and ultimately why they deleted it because it is clearly a man in a suit crab walking across the floor and immediately takes away any threat that the xenomorph might have so well, they must I think have you nailed it Casey. <laughs> it must have... it looks really like it, the positioning and everything doesn't make any sense <laughs> like why it would be walking like that like it doesn't based on how it was moving in the rest of the film like none of that makes any any sense no I think that they uh, were able to do that because they definitely have one of the characters in Prometheus. Like maybe some of the things that they couldn't get away with during this one, they added to Prometheus because like there's definitely a crab walk scene with one of the guys that gets aliened. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then uh, there's like, there was something else I was reading where they, they wanted to have like this, uh, like uh, Ridley have uh, this casual sex scene with uh, one of the other astronauts or not astronauts, blue collar workers. Um <laughs> Space truckers. Yeah, but, like, the idea was that, like, in long stretches, like, it was common for people to, like, you know, get the needs that they, you know, their basic human needs, like, just, like, casual sex up there. And, like, uh, and they did that in Prometheus with the captain, like, Idris Elba and Charlie Theron do have this little thing in Prometheus. So, I don't know. I thought it was funny that, like, there's probably a few things, like, that Ridley couldn't do at the time in 79, but could definitely do it in 2015 or whenever it came out <laughs> <laughs> i don't know uh one thing actually was reading about alien that i thought was interesting because with the face huggers so uh, i never really thought of it in this way but i guess in the original script or how they wanted it it was supposed to be like the xenomorph or alien like how they would you know make this all happen was uh like they raped a human to get them basically impregnated with the alien so yeah. during during the watching alien until i'm reading this never once was i thinking about which it makes perfect sense but i wasn't thinking anybody was impregnating anybody i thought it was just like oh cool this happened and then an alien pops out of his stomach and now is running around the ship and growing but i'm like oh yeah when you put it like no this thing raped a human and then this is their baby <laughs> like uh that it was like was really like put in a different light for me um and so when they put it like that, they also wanted to make sure that the first person this happened to on the ship was a man because they didn't want that stereotype of rape in a woman with the alien. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe that was just me. I didn't really put the rape part together because it no. was an alien. But now it makes perfect sense. <laughs> I actually just watched a pretty good like, you know, 15 minute YouTube essay on this. And he his whole point was that the the entire the entire concept of this alien and the xenomorphs and everything is extremely like it's sexual violence is what the theme is. Because if you think about the face hugger and the scene where it's like wrapping its cord around its neck, like it's such a clear visual of like autoerotic asphyxiation. It's like raping the dude in the mouth. It, uh, and then they show the scene where they like x-ray it and it's got like a tube down its throat and they say, Oh, it's give it's feeding him oxygen. So it's like, not only did the the alien rape him, it's like uh, it's creating this symbiotic pregnant like relationship. And then ultimately it ends with this unwanted thing bursting, you know, being born from the host, which uh, the, the video essay person, you know, relates says that's, you know, every woman's nightmare of rape is that you then have to give birth to this, this thing that was implanted in you without your consent. So the whole thing is very like, that's the whole I think and that's part of like Geiger's horror too and that's probably why it kind of meshes so well it's because I think that's kind of the whole concept of of alien look at the xenomorph and how it how it like attacks things it like sticks that you know his mouth dick out and like rapes you with it like it's yeah. it's everything about it is is phallic and like sexual and I think that was all on purpose to kind of give that that whole like power dynamic of what, you know, rape and that type of thing is. And maybe that's why it's even as freaky as it is. Well, and James, to your Prometheus point, the stuff he didn't want to do, there is a lot of female empowerment in this. Like Elizabeth Shaw, she, she gets a space abortion, you know, she powers on the machine and does it herself. Yeah. She chooses to do it. Yeah. And that's something that you couldn't just like, you, you have to sneak it into a movie like that. You know what I mean? You can't just, make a movie about regular abortions they got to be in space i I don't you know what i mean it's i know i get i get what you're saying (laughs) yeah uh fun fact did you know that charlie Theron was signed on to play that role of numi rapace however you pronounce her name oh i did not 
in in Prometheus, like the oh. main character from uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the original one. Yeah, yeah. The, I, so that chick's character, so the main girl, main person in Prometheus, was supposed to be Charlize Theron, but then some scheduling conflicts came up, so they recasted her after Ridley saw Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and then. Uh, some things got cleared up again. So she came back and was like, I still would love to be a part of this project. If you do have a position for me. And then that's when she took on the role of, uh, you know, the financier, basically his daughter. I think they made the right call. Numi's phenomenal in that movie. She's so good. I think she's good at anything she does. I, I'm a huge fan. Same. Although Charlize Theron is pretty darn flawless in my opinion, but that's just me. That's true. so, so just really quick, just random. So, Brett, like the the older dude that gets killed while he's looking for the cat, an alien. Oh my god, How, are you, were you pissed the whole time this is happening? Like, there's an alien <laughs> running loose, and he's fucking just casually walking around. With it. Actually, everybody, everybody is casually looking for this alien that nobody's ever seen before. No life form has ever existed. They detoured because now this is priority. They don't know what they're looking for, but they saw a glimpse of it. Nobody's just fucking quarantining and stay. This is the ultimate quarantine movie. Why is not everybody just staying in their own quarters and getting on the lifeboat? I'm so okay. Continue. What was the, the was it the <laughs> was it the hold on? I want to ask. Was it the android in the beginning that like broke protocol to let them in? Yes. When she was like, okay, yeah. that well, that makes sense then. Okay. Yeah, it was Bilbo Baggins that did it. Bilbo. Oh, it was fucking Bilbo. That's where I remember that guy Dude, from. He was so awesome in the end as the headless android. That was so creepy. I loved it. Yeah, that's a, that was a good shot. Some you good effects. <laughs> I'm still uh, collating. Um, yeah, so Harry Dean Stanton, the actor that played, played Brett, um, was also in Escape from New York. He played Brain. <laughs> anyway. I, I want to go back to your Jonesy point, Chad, because yeah. I, is he not the true villain? Like, if it's not the Xenomorph, it's Jonesy. Like, he leads Brett to his death. They, he knows they're trying to get to him. He's another life form on the radar and almost leads Ripley to her death. I don't Who, know. Jonesy? Who are you talking about? The, the cat. Oh, the cat. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think too. I'm like, which one was Jonesy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cat had it out for everybody. Should have brought it I know, especially after that first death, they kind of like, he kind of like just his watches like in the eye, his eyes. You can almost see like the, the oh, I'm just watching this. This is great entertainment. I guess to get the uh, cat to like do the like the hiss when the xenomorph kind of. Yeah, you got yeah. it. The xenomorph game, they like, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it was like they distracted the cat, brought in a German shepherd, but like hit it behind like a like a wall. And then as soon as like they started filming, then they took the wall away so that the cat could see the dog. And that's just how they got the cat to react like that. Cool story, James. Then I found five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's All never right. been done in Hollywood until 79. They never scared a cat for reaction with a dog. It never happened. This is the first. <laughs> Look it up. I like hearing stuff like that. I'll do better to acknowledge that, James. That I movie like magic. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Well, with Oscars, uh, this guy did win Best Effects, which is awesome. Um, it so was up for 1980 Oscars. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. So All it was right. up for Best Effects and it won uh, and uh, Best Art Direction. Um, and yeah, it only it did win the Oscar for Best Effects that year. Um, this is the year Kramer versus Kramer, Kramer versus Kramer one best picture. Yeah. Yep. yep. But check out these visual effects: Moonraker, Star Trek, The Black Hole, in nineteen forty one. Do you think they started figuring out how to do space movies during this time? <laughs> <laughs> like, how do we yeah, make I, people float in space? <laughs> I love The Black Hole. I used to love that movie. It's on Disney Plus. I went back and watched it not too long ago, and it's also, so bad, but it's I don't know. Also, Jamie's nickname in high school. Oh, the black my hole. God, yeah, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. I just <laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, he did. Didn't he just mention something about black holes? Something when you're talking about what you've been watching. Black hole sun. Uh, when she hole, comes, no, I don't think wash away the rain. <laughs> Here's God, that was a creepy six... music video. Remember that one with the weird eyes? Stretchy faces. Oh, my God. Thanks, Chad. Soundgarden Wales. Here's your six degrees of Kevin Bacon, though, Chad uh, and James. So Moonraker was nominated for special effects. The effect Kodo, who plays Parker, 
is uh, Mr. Kananga in Live and Let Die, another Roger Moore Bond vehicle. So there you have it. Wait, where was Kevin Bacon? Where's the Kevin Bacon connection? Oh, just, you know, Moonraker connected to Aaron, connected to Kodo, Just connecting who... a movie to another movie isn't how yeah. Kevin Bacon works. <laughs> yeah. He, he, Kevin Bacon Oh, was so in, Toy Story. <laughs> in the 80s. You know. <laughs> Shit, hold on. Uh, cool story, Hansel. I've find, never been I'll to Mount Vesuvius. <laughs> I'll find the bacon. I'll find, I'll find the bacon. The bacon. <laughs> Uh, that's okay. that's the name of the podcast I want. <laughs> Find the bacon. Find the bacon. Um, cinematography Apocalypse Now. I don't know. Nothing else real fun that year. Meryl won for Kramer versus Kramer. Mm. Probably this, the rise of Meryl. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Fun. Mm. Brother, but uh, 79, so notable movies that year. Uh, Superman Meatballs. 2? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, by the way, did I mean I love Superman one, but Superman two was always my favorite just because of the scene where he runs and the outfit changes into the costume and then he leaps and in, into the air. Everybody know what I'm talking about? No, all right, I yeah. just watched it a lot as a kid. Yeah, yep. Now I always forget. Now it's two, the one with uh, Zod. Yep. Okay. Comes son of Jor-El. Kneel before <laughs> Zod. I just like how they get sent away and like the like. Looks like plain panes of glass. Yeah, the Phantom Zone or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and is yeah, it no. uh, prior in that one too, or is that three? That's Superman three. Three. <laughs> Which like it's like kind of like now like as I've grown older and there's so many different like comic book content out there as far as like I don't know, you know sm- like TV shows like Smallville and other things. I'm like yeah. I haven't watched Superman three since I was like ten. But I have to assume then, because it was like Richard Pryor, and then there was the robot chick, so that had to be Brainiac. Like, I really don't know. <laughs> but uh, the Muppets movie. What? This movie, this year sucked. Apocalypse Now. What? We get Mad Max, right? The Jerk. Escape from Alcatraz. Yeah, that's a great movie. The Warriors. Come out to play. We get Phantasm. Look at this. Come so on, when did okay. Ed- when did Enter the Dragon Captain come America. out? There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of kung fu movies out here. Did you say Captain America's on here? Yeah, Captain America, 1979. <laughs> oh my god, it looks so bad. It's like a dude wearing a motorcycle helmet. <laughs> oh my god. Rocky Wait a two? minute. Hold on. What? They made a sequel to American Graffiti called More American Graffiti. <laughs> Is for real? Yikes. American graffiti or You know, look at Ron Howard's got this creepy mustache going on. Poor Ron. Richard Pryor live in concert, though. Mm. I don't know. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, probably not, not super great. <laughs> okay, well, all six degrees of Kevin Bacon this. Uh, so we were talking about the <laughs> octopus teacher, right? Well, then... They were uh, just recently filming Avatar 2, which was also directed by James Cameron, which also has, uh, he directed Aliens. That brings back to our conversation. But in Avatar 2, uh, what's her name? Kate Winslet. She was logged as doing the, holding her breath for the longest as an actor, like seven minutes and 14 seconds for a scene they had to shoot. What? Isn't that nuts? Isn't that nuts? My God, I'd be dead. But it's all Kevin Bacon's back to Aliens because Cameron... James Cameron directed the sequel to this movie. <laughs> okay. R- right, Jamie? <laughs> but no, God, seriously, I'm, like this. I'm seven minutes and... out of my Kevin Bacon IMDb here. Continue, James. <laughs> Are you still searching? There needs to be a, is, there's probably a site that's like where you just got to put in a movie, you know, six Don't, degrees at four. Nobody, nobody search it. That's not as fun. I'll look. I'll I'll I gar- I'll think of it before the show is over here. But yeah, seven minutes and fourteen seconds to shoot for to shoot a scene in Avatar two th- that she held her breath for. So the one the person who had had their the ah the person who had that the longest I don't know what the time was, but it was Tom Cruise in uh that fall or was it Fallout or the Mission Impossible beforehand where he was like diving if you remember that movie okay we'll talk about that when we cover avatar 2 and mission impossible oh, but let's whatever. talk about the box office <laughs> this movie had a budget of 11 million 
the box office, it brought in a hundred. Just like Footloose, million. Kevin Bacon. Thank you. <laughs> God. <laughs> it was released on May 25th, 1979. Some ratings and reviews. So Rotten Tomatoes has a critic review of 98%, 94% audience score. That's really high. IMDb is 8.4. Metacritic's 89. So pretty high. I would say that I would probably give it like four, four and a half on my letterbox. So Jamie, I saw you gave it a five. Is that accurate? Oh, easily. Yeah, yeah. Everything about this movie is perfect to me. There's one scene with Ash's head where you can see the transition from dummy to Ian Holm. But otherwise, yeah, this is a perfect movie. I do want to hold on. We got to call out the alien at the end, though. Like it, it was, I don't know, like the, the climax of the movie is just so great. I love it until like she launches him out of the ship. It was just so it it is obviously like a rubber model flying out the back. Kind of took me out of it a little bit, to be honest with you. I mean, I I can't shoot the movie down for that, but oh, man, for yeah, everything else point. looking like, so good. That was yeah. so dated. Yeah, like the, yeah, the mother room and that last scene is like so seventies. <laughs> like it's just, but yeah, everything else in between is. Oh, you is know great. what does actually while we are pointing that stuff out because we talked a little bit about which version you watched. I yeah, do I was not just gonna like ask the that. director's cut. Yeah, Chet, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So, which version did you guys watch? I watched. I watched both actually. I watched the. Um, the theatrical release and i watched the director's cut today and i noticed there was like one scene for sure i noticed was not in um the theatrical cut which i think probably is makes a huge difference um if you want it to be canon i think in the the alien series because there's a scene where uh ripley walks into a room and it looks like it's been kind of turned into like a nest or a hive so it's kind of like it's got like the alien kind of like the hr geiger stuff everywhere and like then it has like a pod like an egg and it has um like you see like dallas is in it then another character is in another one too then she just takes the torch to it and burns everything but casey and james yeah i don't know if you get which which versions you guys watched i watched the uh yeah not director's cut i was upset because on HBO right now, they have the collection, so that's why. I, so they have the Aliens collection right now, and yeah. so I watched Alien. I clicked on it, and then after it was done, it was like when you know it's like, hey, you want to watch this next? It was the director's cut where I'm like, I didn't even know it was an option. I was so mad. And I'm like, well, I don't. And then I checked the runtime on it, and I'm like, I think the runtime was like a minute less. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And where I'm like, I'm like, well, it can't be that much difference, so like I didn't even bother. <laughs> Yeah, the the differences that I read was like on the the part where they get like the message, the distress call. I think in the director's cut, they actually play some of that audio where it sounds like kind of like weird voices or something like that. And then when um yeah, who's the guy that gets um the the hugger on his face? Oh, Kane. John Hurt's character Kane. Yeah, like when it it shows Hellboy's him. dad. Yeah, voice dad. <laughs> when um, when he's like walking, getting really close up to that egg, it's like a scene where it looks like he has some kind of like not a gun, but some kind of like tool, looks some sort of weapon possibly, but um, to kind of show that he didn't go in there like ignorant, like having some kind of protection with him, but that's oh, yeah. what I kind of read into that. But that's that's about it. I think the biggest difference is though is having that scene where the where you see Dallas and I think it's Parker. Maybe she calls out, but yeah, I'm with you, Chad. I, I, I prefer the version without that scene. I like never knowing what happens to Dallas. He's just gone. Yeah. And you can kind of put the pieces together. Yeah. Um, is there ever a, a time in this movie where, so again, watching this and then immediately Prometheus, like prequels style, trying to figure out like what the connections are in some of this, uh, was there ever a, a Wayland like or like on their cargo ship, the guys who were bringing stuff back from whatever planet they were on, like where was it like from, from the Wayland group or whatever? Or we, we don't really know what company they work for. They just all of a sudden are, hey, here's your distress call. This takes precedence. It's in the computer, right? When they're in the mother room. Is that 
the only way we know? Or do they Maybe. say Waylon? I don't know. But I think do, they say Waylon. Do they? Okay, I was just curious. I assumed that there had to been a connection in that way. Um, but yeah, just wasn't totally positive on that, so I was just curious. Um, also, Kevin Bacon, I figured it out already. <laughs> so, if you want to hear it, it is uh, Sigourney Weaver, Alien, uh, was in Heartbreaker with... Um, not Melissa Joan Hart. Who's the other three named chick? Jennifer Love Hewitt. Um, and then she was in, I know what she did last summer with Ryan Philby. Ryan Philby was in 54 with uh, Nev Campbell. Nev Campbell was in Wild Things with Kevin Bacon. Boom. Oh, <laughs> James, that's why you're our encyclopedia. There you go. You just proved it. Boom. I do the namesake. All day. All day. <laughs> sorry also wayland uh not to tie it with video games clearly i seem to be the video game guy uh wayland is the corporation in the new cyberpunk game which also has a pretty long string of uh history when it comes to i think there was a tabletop game that that cyberpunk is based off of like a D type uh tabletop rpg um, so Wayland uh, is also has connections there. They're not related, um, but they're also an evil corporation in that world as well. Well, I got to say, this is actually the first movie in a while that we've done, and I do not own the Nintendo game for this, if there ever was one. I have to assume there was. I think there was one, f- like an Alien 3 NES game. That makes sense. But I know there's been several Alien, like, was it Alien Marines, like Alien PS2, 3, 4 games lately? But I would say that Alien had a huge impact on the game Metroid. Well, that's a. Mo- I mean, is it? Are there games like that that are untouchable? Like, I'm surprised there hasn't been a Metroid game or a Zelda game. But like, I understand there's going to be such heavy criticism on anything like that that I, it's going to be very, very difficult. And I understand that. But yes, watching Alien, thank you for bringing that up, Chad. Yeah, I thought Metroid for sure. Like, this could be. This was like I wonder if this was how Metroid, like the idea, kind of came about. Yeah, I got a list here of like, uh, where is it? <clears throat> Similarities between Alien and Metroid. Um, here, I'll just go through this list. Both, uh, this is on MetroidFandom.com. Both Metroid and Alien feature a female lead protagonist. Pa- protagonist. <clears throat> I can talk. A pretty obvious one there. Uh, director of Alien is named Ridley Scott. A mini boss in Metroid, who became an antagonist in later games, is named Ridley. The Nostromo oh, yeah. ship is called Mother. The antagonist in Metroid is Mother Brain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the end of the film shows Ripley barely escaping by exploding the Nostromo. The end of the game shows Samus barely escaping the explore. The exploding Turin facility. Both characters are sole survivors of the explosion. Um, Apart from Ripley's Cat Jones. And if I remember correctly, was it Super Metroid that if you beat the game with getting all the bonuses and all the secrets and everything else, like slowly but surely the spacesuit came off Samus even further and further and further. And as an eight year old boy, you're like, come on. Yeah, that was, I think it was like, that's in every game. But I remember that was for sure like the original. But like, I remember too, you could just like put in like the code. But I think for the original, yeah, if you got there like, was a code. It there was a code. Hates everybody. Remember, you'd have to put in like the uh, like thirty two bit <laughs> or thirty two character codes for some of those older Nintendo games. Yes, yes, yes. God, was awful. that a real thing? I always yeah. heard that as like a oh wow. No, yeah, you'd have to write it down. Like you always fuck up like zeros and O's. No way. I knew about the codes. I just, I, I had always heard about the Metroid unsuiting of uh, Samus. I didn't know that was a real thing that you could do. Yeah. Yeah. And if, I think if you got like all of like the energy containers or something like that. Yeah. Then like, yeah, it would. <clears throat> There's like different stages too. Like one, it was just like remove the helmet. And then, yeah, it was like the swimsuit. <clears throat> um, Here's one more, and then I'll get off the metro kick. The design of the Chozo statues, so like the where the power ups were on those statues in Metroid, um, so it's possibly based in fossil on the fossilized engineer alien found, or the engineer oh, found in sure. alien. So I see that. Uh, 
Yeah. I'm looking to see if like a Metroid movie is like in the works and like the first thing that pops up is while there is no indication there's any active development of a Metro movie like and then goes further down to saying like Brie Larson would be the perfect Samus no question. Oh my god. Oh my god. All right. So, what's next? Da, da, da. James you, or Jamie, you have some questions here, so I'm going to go through these. Then um, we'll do what's which age is the best or worst. Maybe do some favorite scenes. Um, then do we want to do your new segment, James? James, uh, ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. I'm assuming I have theme music. If you want to do it at the end or not, it's it's up to you. And if yeah, it's fine. Uh, so. yeah, it, <clears throat> if everyone's good. up with it or down. <laughs> Absolutely. Up. Absolutely. Okay. Um, da, da, da. So, Jamie, you always post some questions for us in here in the chat or on the outline. <laughs> um, so, question number one. Is Ripley the coolest sci-fi hero of all time? If not, who else you got? I don't know. No, no she like phoned it in on this one. Yeah. <laughs> I kept on waiting for her to be like, get away from her, you B. And I'm like, that is not this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next one. It's coming. <laughs> I think she gets more badass in time. Well, so I was watching how all these alien films connect. I was watching some YouTube on it. And like, I had no idea that she is like cloned, then brought back to life, and then <laughs> reincarnated. Like she just becomes this god or goddess. It's 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 nuts. Oh yeah, the, she's like key to the franchise until we get to Prometheus. I yeah, I think they were probably scared to make an alien movie without her. I was gonna say, Jamie, do you know if she was asked or why she wasn't in Prometheus? It is curious. That's oh, because it really is technically it is a prequel though. I guess she's not born. That's, yeah, that's it's a hella right. prequel. Yeah. Yeah. Because original Ripley is a real human and then like things go crazy. Ooh, I don't man. even remember exactly what happened. Well, I guess you're right. <laughs> but like before she was alive, I guess. I don't know. I thought Prometheus was pretty interesting. Pretty good film. Yeah. It's fine. Then you go back and watch that one. I like the first time I watched it. So I remember everyone being really down on it and I remember watching it and being entertained. So. Let's see. Da, 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 da. I just lost my train of thought. I was gonna say something. Oh, I did want to say that, like when I first, like the first five minutes of this movie, I just wanted to like stop and like go play Dead Space, <laughs> which is an awesome like sp space survival horror game. Um, I got a question. Like, I need yeah. help with this. Uh, so you asked if she was like the best what sci-fi heroine or whatnot, or just hero? Or, yeah, sci-fi hero, hero, whatever. Yeah. Uh, can can you just anybody rattle off some other ones? Like, are we talking like I like mean Buck Rogers? Like, like well, yeah. oh, <laughs> okay. So we're not Buck just saying Rogers. we're not just saying space women. Like, I'm thinking like it's gonna be Summer Glau, right? In Firefly, it's gonna be River. Oh yeah, I mean, put her up against whoever you like. Does she? Uh, how does she stack up against Darth? Oh, Vader, I think she you know? could beat the crap out of Princess Leia and Ridley. Am no, I, I just, I'm sorry, am I, are those fighting words, Jamie? Them, them are fighting words. What I'm I mean, trying to say, I don't have any strong opinions on this, so you guys okay. can battle it out. I mean, no, or, I really. or I don't know, Athura could probably take a, that'd be a good fight. That would be a good fight. I can't, I can't disagree with you there. But then if we get some, uh, Earth, Flash if, we get some if we get some Earth ladies involved, I'm pretty sure Dana Scully will just dominate everybody. Did you say bird ladies? <laughs> Earth ladies. Oh. I was gonna say those are the bird men in Flash if get, Gordon. So if you get if you get the bird ladies involved, then the chick from Home Alone two takes a cake. <laughs> Does anyone named Dallas ever survive a film? Oh, this Nobody... was just a fun thought I had. It's it's like the coolest name, Dallas. You know, anyone named Dallas is you're like that is a cool dude. I don't even need to look at him. Yeah. My great really? grandfather's name Casey's was Dallas. Not... He didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I was just How does Dallas fare in the Debbie Does series? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Ask Debbie. Ask, well, yeah, and then I was like, oh, Dallas man, survives that. 
I think. <laughs> <laughs> that Texas Dallas is the reason. Willis. Though. They're the only ones that do. Yeah, because I was like, every movie there's a Dallas, they freaking die. Mm. So there are three w- rules that I live by: never get less than twelve hours sleep, never play cards against a guy who is who has the same name as a city, and never get involved <laughs> with a woman with a tattoo of a dagger on her body. <laughs> What's that from? <laughs> Teen Wolf. Oh. <laughs> Oh god, that's true. Like I'm thinking to myself, like I'm like, I'm not gonna trust anybody named Dallas, Tennessee, like or what, <laughs> Memphis, Memphis Reigns. A little Nick Cage shout out. Oh, come here, Austin. Yeah. Oh my god, I never <laughs> never trust an Austin. No. Or a mini. Ugh. Except for Stone Cold. Stone Cold. Three sixteen. Oh, Casey, would you trust a guy named Vegas? Yes. <laughs> to like go gambling with, but oh, not, to, not to save me. <laughs> <laughs> save me, Vegas. Grab my strong arm. No, Vegas. I'm good. <laughs> All right. All right. Pick a favorite scene and go, James. God. Uh,. I think honestly, just the original time you see the face hugger, like I think for 79 effects and everything else, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was pretty flawlessly done. Um, So just enjoyable and scary at the same time. Um, But once you start calling it rape, then I don't like saying that I like the rape scene the best. (laughs) Well, just don't say you like the rape scene the best. I like like the face hugging. The The face face hugging was face hugging was (laughs) classic. Yeah, yeah, that's what I I like the best, I guess. Uh, Casey. Yeah, I I want to say the the chest burster just because it was such an awesome one. But there is, as much as I love that scene, there is a little bit of uh, it, it's a kind of silly at one point when you've got the little alien there and he just kind of zooms away. It felt a little comical because it kind of felt like a Muppet, you know, just kind of zooming away, yeah. <laughs> just like this Benny Hill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, kinda. Everybody's running around like, the ship. <laughs> I don't and I don't know where it's it's like triggering a memory of some other movie or show in my Space head. Balls. Uh, yeah, it's it, maybe that's what it is. It just Hello, looks like the darling. space ball Hello, scene. My baby. Hello, oh my, my god! Girl. I forgot all about that. <laughs> yes. So like that's what's in my head when I see that. So like it loses the scare factor. Because then think of it, like if you're on a ship and this alien just bursts out of the dude, I would be like, I don't know, swinging something. I wouldn't just like back up and say let it go, even though I think it was the android dude that was saying let it go or don't hurt it. But like. Bro, if he just bust out of me, I would be trying to defend myself. I mean, not me. If he busted out of my buddy. Um. Anyways, my favorite. Other than that, my favorite scene. I really think this the ship exploration is just awesome when they're going through and and checking out this the alien ship. Yeah. Um. I just think the aesthetics of that whole that ship and that scene. It's just, and I think that was uh Giger's influence as well. Um. On the ship and and whatnot. Uh. Yep. It's like the ship is is it's almost inside feels mechanical but also like organic like it was a living thing um and then the i don't know what they call it uh they've read that you see in other alien movies too but like the the seat that the alien like lives in you know the dead alien that's sitting there um that's just so cool like that whole that whole get up i, I love that scene right and we see that in prometheus don't we like what? yeah it's like yeah. a suit they get into to fly or whatever yeah yeah it's yeah. like their space suit yeah, so cool. yeah, I'd say honestly, go back and take a look at Prometheus. Like I, like I agree. So Chad, it had been a while since I'd seen it too, uh, but I just remember really enjoying it. And I, yeah, it was awesome when I watched it the second time right now. So I recommend it. Yeah, because I watched. It, I mean, I haven't like watched any Alien movies probably twenty years before that. So I probably need to do my homework before hopping into that. But yeah. I would say I'll hop in and do my favorite scenes. I would say for me first, I want to say a runner up would be the scene where um, uh, Ash is like, and uh, Ripley are fighting and he like kind of knocks her out or whatever. And he's like trying to choke her with like the wrapped up magazine, you know? And then Parker comes in and just like knocks his head off with a fucking fire extinguisher. Oh. He's like, no, I think he knocks his head off with the porn mag. That he was like, uh, does he hit his head off? I, no, he knocks it his was head part off. Of that. It's like the fire extinguisher or whatever. Oh, sure. <laughs> Just like, clonk. That was part of the that that essay I watched about it being like sexual violence too, is even mm-hmm. the android gets in on it and like d- tries to 
kill her in the same way the xenomorph does right like raping her mouth with ironically a porno mag in what looks like a a shrine to pornography right Right, in that little cubby yeah just all those same like violent sexual themes super weird yeah yeah but i want to say like um casey i really like the scene that you talk about too like in the ship just kind of like i like how like a lot of the film was like really claw like you know tight and like kind of claustrophobic like closed spaces but we're when you're in like the alien ship everything's like really big and kind of vast and open so it kind of makes you feel small you know and like this alien craft um but for me is like the scene where it's towards the end of the film where like <clears throat> she like ripley like sees like the xenomorph and like the the fan is giving like that strobe light effect and she's like slowly like creeping down kind of like in terror you know the xenomorph before she takes off i just ah, i fucking love that scene i love that part and uh i'll clean up here chad i piggybacking off of your um ash in the magazine scene i remember the first time i saw this movie i think it was around high school and i had known about the chest burster like that's the big uh twist or one of them anyway like oh my god i didn't know that was going to happen but i didn't know that ash was an android the first time i saw this movie So when you kind of figure that out and then you figure out his motivations throughout the entire movie, that's kind of like a blow your mind moment. Um, So I remember that one standing out the first time I saw this, but I think for me, it's, it's a tie between Dallas and the air ducts. That's just a purely well shot um, tension moment. Um, We get like a a horror, you know, like, like the, you don't get the music. It's the blipping of the radar. But um, for me, it's I think it's just the opening, the opening shot, the ship tour and the awakening, just these quiet, wide panning shots, seeing the crew, seeing them come together. And it's just this is like what great horror does is it takes its time to set up the place and the people and, you know, it makes all the bad things that happen to them that much more effective. All right. What? So I think overall, f- for me, I think this this movie is. Wait, let me stop for a second. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on to which age the best or worst in this film. I think we probably touched on a lot of stuff already, but um, Jamie, you had some stuff in here. Why don't you start us off, and we'll go around if we just want to kind of throw in our two cents. Oh yeah, and. Casey kind of touched on this a little bit earlier too. I just, um, I love the design of the ship. Like Casey said, um, you know, it's even in the future, I think, uh, you know, a lot of sci-fi gets it wrong with what our futuristic ships will look like. And I'll take any excuse I can to talk about when I used to work on the railroad, but I, 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 I used to work freight trains and that was the vibe I got from this, um, mineral vessel that they're using to transport. And, it's like, of course, in the future, we're still going to have, you know, blue collar, possibly union people just moving shit from one place to another. And it's not going to be the sexiest ship in the fleet, but it's going to get the job done. And you're still going to need workers to power the thing. And this is what it's going to look like. Yeah, it gave me a very like cargo ship vibe too, right? Like ship, I think, is even more of an apt uh, metaphor too, because you're out in the middle of the ocean and if the ship goes down, you're going down with it. And obviously there's a spaceship, you know, you, something goes wrong when you're in space, you're hosed. Right. And that's why, you know, everyone, everyone has their job, you know, it's Parker and Brett are down fixing the stuff. You know, if, if they, if something happens to them, the whole crew is in trouble. And then yeah. you have, uh, Kane and, uh, Lambert, who appear to be the pilots or navigators, Dallas is the captain, Ripley's just jack of all trades, and on and on it goes. Like everyone has their job and they have to do it well to keep this big thing a going. I think Casey said it earlier. Yeah, it felt very like um and much like space is like water. It felt very like a much like a submarine, uh, where they're down there fixing stuff and yeah. I'd agree. Yeah, I would say which age is the best is just like, again, kind of like all the ship designs, the freighter to the um, alien ship, those hold up quite well. Again, for me, I think the things that have aged the worst are just 
that room that the uh, mother is in <laughs> in that and that ending scene with the, the alien in space kind of bouncing around on the ship so yeah i would say those are the only things period that aged poorly i think the alien the xenomorph everywhere else looked great um in all the low lit scenes and, and when you're only seeing parts of it it's really just the the full body reveal and in the way that it had to bounce. why did it have to bounce like i don't it just felt so unnatural to space if there was a if i don't know it should have just been launched out and that was that but like the way that they launched out and like the gun got stuck it almost made it feel like oh maybe it'll hold on it's like just no it, it could have just got ejected and that could have been that they didn't even have to show it leaving the ship to be honest and i wouldn't have felt sold you know i wouldn't have felt short sold or anything if they just showed it like ejected from inside show it ejected out of the thing and not shown the outside shot um I, I don't think yeah. I would have been disappointed with that. Yeah, it, and Jamie, you're our horror movie expert. Um, is that something that is like a horror movie trope that gets kind of caught here that we're getting um, hung up on? Well, like you that, definitely that one last moment, like the one, like the 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 terror, like never dies kind of thing. I it's think it's always coming the, back. I think that's the best argument for it because I when before I said it was flawless, Casey, you, you did talk me into it. I think I would have felt the same if they had just if she had opened the doors, shut it, and you never see it again, or you just see it floating away. That would have been enough for me too because you know the harpoon hits it and you know it's got acid blood, so I'm like, oh shit, she's got to be careful with that by the door, or she's dead too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they create this problem and then blast it out of the ship with a harpoon and none of the acid gets on the door. It's like, you just made a bigger problem for yourself kind of thing. Or they could have gotten like really into tropes and just like, like you said, Casey, like it gets shot. We don't see it right. Float off in the space, but the, the ending scene where she's going into like her stasis or whatever with a sh- we see the ship kind of floating away but then we see like a close up on the ship and it's the xenomorph is hanging is is riding on top of the ship and that's the end of the movie oh yes yeah, be- of- <laughs> i would only accept that if it was surfing like teen wolf on the top right. of the ship yeah. and, like giving you like the chaka <laughs> like so, <King> 10. yes <laughs> yes <laughs> During that scene, like Ridley wearing those like two T under ruse, super unnecessary. Have you noticed well, that? At least it wasn't like a thong. It, you know? I would agree, but I'm just sitting here going like, it, "What? That that was like the the like underwear of the era, though." In seventy you nine, know <clears throat> yeah, Chad, you're our expert. I would understand. So okay, ooh. <laughs> Yeah. That, that was an oh, age was... thing, not like uh, he's an. Underwear. Oh, not like a, he likes women's underwear. <laughs> no, because <laughs> I would have been two. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Uh, but anyways, another Kevin Bacon thing, Jamie. Um, the voice of mother was in Superman three. We talked about that earlier too. Kevin Bacon. Oh, James, you're too good at this. I am. You should I make am. a website. You should make. I the should algorithm. make a website. Uh, the thing for me that lasted or survived uh, well with age is the cast. Like, what a crazy young cast that went on and did better things. Um, yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah. I mean, you recognize almost everybody in there instantly from something else. Uh, like, from Bilbo Baggins to, yeah, like, <laughs> to Hellboy's dad to... Uh, Who's Hellboy's guy, dad? Uh, John Hurt, the guy that got face hugged. Oh, shit. Yep, and then even Tom Skerritt, uh, Dallas was. I recognize him from Top Gun. So I was so. gonna say, is this like his? Because I'm not a big Tom Skerritt fan. I feel like I don't like most of the movies that he's in, but I feel like this is like the tipping point for him. Like after this, he just becomes like that guy in movies. <laughs> I mean, he was like in Contact. He was a similar role, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Guy, he's fucking awful in Contact. He. And I cannot shake this. Every time I watch this movie, this was not a problem in high school because I was not married. But Tom Skerritt, specifically in this movie, has <laughs> such a striking resemblance to my father-in-law. It's uncanny. Oh, God. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's the weirdest <laughs> thing. So now every time I watch this movie, I have to, I have to see my father-in-law get killed by the xenomorph. And that's <laughs> a personal that's problem. 
Does Mickey feel the same way? I, I gotta ask her. She she fell asleep during this one, but I'll ask her. <laughs> I will blurp out Mickey. Oh yeah. <laughs> the the last episode that, that I did edits for, I think we were all like listing like our kids' names. <laughs> so I think on a couple of them I did like uh like little beeps. <laughs> Like bleeps and blips to cover up the names. I thought it was kind of funny, but well, you don't want me to talk about your kid Hamlet and Schmorgle. <laughs> Schmorgle. <laughs> your cricket sound too for when James was having mic oh, problems. Oh, did you like that? Made, that made me laugh out loud. <laughs> Casey's like insert cricket sound here, and I was like, okay, and cricket sounds come in. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Cool. That was Alien. So we're gonna start a new segment. Uh, kind of based on some conversations that James and I had. So I think we just decided that we were going to kind of add it to the end of each podcast episode where James just kind of asks us a question because he's a journalism or a journalism, <laughs> a I'm journalist a, at art. He's a journalism. <laughs> I'm a journalism. No. God, I cannot talk. I, I just I was trying I to say a funny uh Chad and I were talking, or, or I was talking to Chad about, like, I decided it would be fun, or at one point, it was either a side pod or something else as a part of this, but I just wanted to interview him, like, what made him want to do this, like, his love for movies, and just kind of start asking some just questions around that, and he thought it'd be a good idea, like, well, why don't we just ask the group some of those questions, or whatnot, so I guess, for me, I like, what is your most fun experience of uh, a movie you're going to going to the movies specifically like going to the cinema and like what was it about that experience like so for me i think i've talked about before it was uh we had a movie theater in my hometown that was like i would say let's say five to six blocks away it was it was not very difficult to get to and more importantly it was like the dirtbag dollar theater so like the floors were sticky um like and like the chairs slouched down to the bottom like i would be I'd be curious now to Google like, Hey, I wonder when that thing was actually built. Um, but, uh, so that's, I mean, that's my love of that theater. Cause we, that's where we spent all of our summers. It was air conditioned. It was a buck. And I remember one summer we saw the movie cutthroat Island with Gina Davis, like probably 20 times. And I thought it was the greatest movie of all time. I don't know if you've seen cutthroat Island or watched it recently. God, does that movie suck? But I think also, like, before Pirates Cut of the Caribbean... Cutthroat Island sounds like a Survivor spinoff. It probably... Yeah, it is. <laughs> no, but, like, I just remember, like, I'd have to look up, like, all the details of it now. But, like, that was, like, the first real pirate movie. Like, it went Swiss Family Robinson, then Cutthroat Island, and then uh, then in, not until, like, Pirates of the Caribbean. So, like, even until I saw Pirates of the Caribbean, I thought it was, like, the best... Uh, pirate movie of all time but that's just what i like one of my fondest memories was that's like what we did uh, like one summer was we would like walk down to the theater me and my brother and some friends we'd go see cutthroat island and then we would head back and go play like build a fort in the backyard or play tag or whatever else happened that day before cell phones and stuff but that's just me how about you guys what's one of your fondest memories yeah i'll hop in uh for me it was um <clears throat> what kind of these i had like three things i was kind of pop my mind but um but a specific theater um made me think of the paradise theater in Faribault where I went to high school and um it wasn't like the greatest theater and like James like you said it's like you know had like the sticky floors and <clears throat> you know I remember always going there like in middle school and like we'd get like the sit in the back row and get like the box of gobstoppers and you know roll them down the floor in the middle of like the the quietest part of the film you know just to be funny but um yeah it's a place where we went like every, <laughs> like every Friday no, night yeah I'm know, sorry no kids, I'm like, like rem- <laughs> remember myself doing that yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it was like the the thing about the theater was is like where the screen was it was um like the walls of the theater then around the screen it was like a castle so like the walls was you know it was like the size of the castle then like the front was like the lookout towers and stuff like that so it was always kind of cool and it was like how it was kind of backlit too and i just that was just kind of like the i don't know just was always kind of like a cool experience as a kid now now they turned it into like an actual theater for play um or for plays in Faribault, but yeah that was always like a 
a fun experience and fond memories as a child. So like seeing great movies from there, like uh, the f- first Tim Burton Batman and, you know, seeing like random movies like Joe versus the volcano and um, like uh, Wayne's world. So yeah, it's good times. Jamie, you want me to go? <laughs> you go ahead. We, we <laughs> unmute him at the same time. <laughs> okay, we'll strap in because this one is a doozy. Uh-oh. I don't know if you guys, when you were in high school or anything, uh, did you ever wait in line for new movies on opening night? Like wait outside the theater for like an hour or two to make sure you got in? Was that a oh, thing sure. anywhere else? No, because oh, so there's we like used... 10 people like going to the movie total. <laughs> It, oh man! It was a sing, but I worked at the theater, so I was always the one like making fun of those guys because I saw it the night before. <laughs> oh yeah, so so we line line waiting was a big deal uh, in 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 my small town, and when really popular movies came out, um, we would wait in line. I remember, I think it was the second Matrix movie. Um, we waited in line. I was, I think, third in the line at one point, and for some reason, when and this isn't even the story I want to tell. This is a tangent. Uh, when they opened the doors, there was a mad rush of people just trying to budge the line to the point where we broke the front door because people were like pulling on the door. It like came off the hinges because people were, were mobbing into the theater. But the, the story I want to tell about a line, and this was after they had perfected the line process and, and we would like be single file wrapped around the building, like up against the wall. And uh, to set the scene, this was, uh, I think, the second Lord of the Rings, uh, maybe the third, but at least the second. So we'd already gotten a taste of of that sweet, sweet Hobbit adventure. And the line was wrapped around the whole building. And the the shape of the building was uh, is important because from the front door, there was, you know, a long wall. And then it jutted kind of in and over and back out. So there was like a big concrete kind of opening um, where, you know, there was a big big uh, sidewalk area that wasn't the road or anything but it was part of of this area so a big opening and this this gentleman at one point we'd been there for at least an hour it was dark out it was i think snowing um so it was just very uh very moody and uh, a, a guy who i later would learn was going back and forth to his car drinking profusely um and smoking a lot of weed and probably eating edibles so he was very fucked up walks out and he starts giving oh man this must have been the third one he starts basically giving the battle speech of some kind like super slurry but he's like holding his fists up and he's yelling like tonight's the night we ride together and the whole place is just cheering this dude on so it's like this crazy hype everyone's so excited to see lord of the rings flash forward we're watching the movie i think homie was uh you know drunk homie was sitting in the front row uh, and I think this was one where there was an intermission. So there was a short intermission in the middle of the movie because it was so long. So I don't know which Lord of the Rings that was. Uh, but then the dude comes back to his seat. Some lady that was sitting next to him had set her purse in his seat just to set it there. I don't know why. I don't think she was trying to jack his seat or anything. Um, dude pulls a knife on her. Uh, the police had to come and he did not get to see the last half of the movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was a fun film. Oh my god! Wow. Every, was everybody okay? Dun, dun, oh yeah, everyone's fine. Dun, 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 dun. I, 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 I don't think he was actually going to hurt her. He was just real not not sober. And he say, "That's not a knife. Now this is a knife. <laughs> this, is a knife. <laughs> this is a knife." And someone's like, "Wrong movie." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Casey's like, "It was weird. Same thing happened in Crocodile Dundee." <laughs> weird. Everyone has knives in this town. Doesn't make any sense. Oh, was, it was uh, awesome. Uh, we actually. We, I was at last Saturday night. Yeah, last Saturday. We um I was just flipping through channels and Crocodile Dundee was on showtime. It was brought probably about fifteen minutes into the movie. And I was like, I just gotta just watch this for a couple minutes. And they watched it. And then like we ended up watching like the whole movie. Where I fell asleep but yeah. finished it. <laughs> That's why we need to have a sequels conversation because Crocodile Dundee two I'd say is better than the first. If we talk about movies that are better than the first movies. Oh yeah. I don't I remember that one at all. I think it's, I remember, it's where they go to. Uh, they start in like L.A. or New York or whatever, but then they end up going to Australia. Oh, because is that the one where because because like his friend is getting sick or something like that? Is that what brings him back? No, it's no? Uh, no. They kidnap his girl, and she's got like oh. microfilm from her ex husband or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll put yeah, like yeah. the cartel 
on oh, their it's a, <laughs> cartels. It's an eighties movie, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. All right, I'll back clean up here. That's going to be tough to follow, Casey. I don't have any uh, drunken knife shenanigans, but and I will say, <laughs> I James, just... this was. <laughs> This Sorry, good... Jimmy, I'm just like all of a sudden you're like, so I was seeing the bodyguard and uh <laughs> <laughs> Oh this is a great tissues. question. No, I had I had a really hard time picking just one. So I'm gonna use one that nobody might ever talk about this film ever again because it doesn't deserve to be talked about. But um I I remember I was uh my wife and I, we met in college and one of the things we did, we both loved movies, so I mean, that was always an easy, cheap date, especially for a college student. Um, so we went to movies all the time at the St. Cloud Theater. I, I know Casey's probably been there. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I, I took her to this movie. So I'm a big horror fan. And, you know, there's that stage of the relationship where you pretend to like things because you like the person. And she oh. was totally <laughs> pretending to like horror movies, like 100%. And I oh, brought what a her good chameleon. She is. Oh my god! You told me about this one before, Jamie. Did I? <laughs> yeah. About uh, my soul to take. We. Uh, yeah, it was. It's a Wes Craven movie. I'm just gonna read the description. A serial killer returns to his hometown to stalk seven children who share the same birthday as the date he was allegedly put to rest. It's basically Nightmare on Elm Street. He just took the idea and made it. But I was like, oh my god, Wes Craven, one of my favorite directors. The movie was awful. Like terrible and like i said i it came out we saw it and uh nobody has talked about it since because it's probably his worst movie but um yeah and i was all nervous i was like oh man that was that was not good but she didn't leave me and we're married and we have two kids so <laughs> that, that is love now i want to watch that movie to see how much she does love you <laughs> I, right, it's, I thought... it's not good oh i thought yeah, i was thinking of the story you that you going? told me jamie about um I thought you took her to the witch. Oh, I did do that. Yeah, we. I took her to the witch, and the, <laughs> after the, uh, wh- wh- how did you the baby pesto? Is that how you yeah, call it, Chad? The baby pesto mortar. <clears throat> I just daggers. She was staring daggers. At Wait, my head. what? What? Have you, have you seen the, the no witch? the bitch the, the bitch? No, and I won't. They smash up a baby like guacamole. Well, spoiler alert. So, like, yeah. So they kidnap. Or like the yeah, witch, I know like, that part. Like the baby them. disappears, right? Yeah. Then like, there's a scene where it's like, it, it's kind of. I think it's kind of cool. It's really creepy. Where it's just like this concert, like dun 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 dun. dun, dun. It's part of the soundtrack, but it's basically it's a uh, a witch like making uh like churning baby butter. <laughs> yeah. Oh my <laughs> goodness! To YouTube yeah. I go. I've already read the whole synopsis and spoiled the movie because. I fell in love with what's her face from yeah, uh, the Taylor Queen's Joy. Gambit. Yeah. yeah, she's awesome Isn't in that movie. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. star of the Big Eyes paintings. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right, Chad. She did stay with me after that one too. She was like staring at me as if I knew a that was going to happen in the movie, and b I made it happen. I didn't either. <laughs> we should also play a fun game on this. Uh, oh, I shouldn't uh, watch this right before bed. No, certainly no. Not. No, no, don't that do that. Movie, that it makes movie you terrifies think. me. And Jamie, yeah. Jamie, tell tell everyone what you told me about, like why you won't buy that movie on Blu-ray. Oh, I just oh, like I just don't want it in my Disney? house. I, I like yeah. <laughs> I you know I've, <laughs> I I grew up Catholic and I've shed most of that in my life, but something's like it's still in my DNA, and I'm I'm just I'm really superstitious about stuff like that. Can't explain it. Like yeah, I just I I love it. It's a great movie. I don't want it in my house. It's evil. I think do you have a copy of The Ring in your house? I do. Yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> on VHS. <laughs> Seven days. VHS. I was like, yeah, mine's on VHS. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the joke's on you. Know where to play it or copy it. Yeah. But it's in safe keepings. I think I've said All this right. before that uh, with the Vivitch, yeah. uh, they uh, like satanic groups like watch this like religiously because it's like the best depiction of satan <laughs> oh god like but i'm like it's i'm terrifying. You're not wrong it's terrifying <laughs> yeah no it's it is terrifying but it's so good <laughs> yeah all right all right that was great thanks james for bringing that up i can't wait to do more of these in the future so um but before we go 
I want to thank you for downloading this episode of Movie Time Machine. And remember, new episodes drop on Fridays. Please send your questions, comments, and feedback to moviemachinepod at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter at at Movie Machine Pod. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you next time. Goodbye. Kevin Bacon. See you. Bye.